Hey, my name is Bjorn Sparman. I'm co-founder and CTO of RLP. It's Rapid Liquid Print. Hi, my name is Skendi Kianizo. I'm co-founder and CEO of RLP. RLP is a 3D printing company focused on high-speed silicone printing at large scale. Hello, gentlemen. Hey, Jody. How's it going? This is one of those moments where um, I've known you guys for now, goodness gracious, what, four or five months? Yeah. Yeah, very short time. And um, I have been mentoring you in your company, but the, and, and it's the end, like I always say to people, I go, I can mentor you, be, I could talk to you on the, this podcast before, and I can talk to you afterwards. I don't talk to you be in between. So this is your time. This is now it's the end of the accelerator. And I wanted to make sure that people knew who you guys were because um, I love that I interact with rock stars and you guys are rock stars. So I want people to know who you are, where you came from, et cetera. So I want each of you guys to like, go through where you came from and just keep talking and telling the story until you guys meet. So share your stories. Um, I, I, I'll, I'll go first, Bjorn. Um, so I, I'm an Haitian American, uh, born in New Jersey. Um, but grew up in Haiti. So my parents are Haitian. Uh, spent all my life in Haiti. Um, back in the 90s, we moved to Canada when things were a little tough in the country. Um, spent three, three to four years in Montreal. Um, that was like my first snow experience. <laughs> Talk about a culture change here. Um, and then went back to Haiti, finished high school. After graduating, went to college at Philadelphia University, uh, where I started architecture. Um, you know, growing up in Haiti, my dad is a civil engineer. I was on site all the time, so I, I had a love for architecture then. Um, and while after finishing Philadelphia, uh, at Philadelphia University, graduated, and then the earthquake happened in Haiti. And it, it became kind of a no-brainer. Like, of course, I had to go back and help out. And in 2010, four months after the earthquake, I kind of packed everything up, left most of my stuff with my brother, went back to Haiti, um, and kind of helped out and worked with a nonprofit called Architecture for Humanity there for a year. And we, we helped redesign and, and reconstruct um, schools that were affected by the earthquake. Um, spent a year there. After a year, came back, moved to Boston. Um, that's where, while I was in Haiti, that's where I met not, my now wife. Uh, she was living in Boston. So after I finished my contract, I was like, all right, I'm moving to Boston. <laughs> um, and we spent the year in Boston. And at the time, the economy was tough and decided, you know what, I want to go back to Haiti again and help a local firm there, kind of provide my skills, um, work there for a bit, and eventually ended up getting a, a job in Boston. So I moved back to Boston at a firm and spent three to four years at that firm and reconnected with one of the co-founders of this company, um, Skylar Tibbetts and Jared Locks, who we all went to college together and they were working at MIT at a research lab called Stuff Assembly Lab. And I said, hey, I'd love to join. And they said, we'd love to have you kind of help manage the lab and the people. So that's how I started at the Self Assembly Lab and where I met Bjorn. Yep. Okay. All right. And then now, of course, that's a pause. I love it. There's the natural pause. That's the start. That's the setup. Yeah. So, I mean, that's... <laughs> That's where, that's where, so Skinny and I were, have been, has been decimates for, gosh, I mean, since I started. Well, do you think you can just start there? Are you joking? No, well, yeah, that, that, that's where we're, we're touching off. But so that's where, where, where we met. I mean, how, how I got there, that's a whole other story. So um, I, I came to Boston for, for, uh, for grad school, like a ton of people, um, to, you know, Cambridge, Somerville, that whole scene um, at MIT in the architecture department in a small program that's actually called Art Culture Technology. No, 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 no. Are you, what, no, wait, you came to Boston from where? Who are you? you I'm going back, I'm, I'm working backwards, don't worry about it. We'll get there. Um, <laughs> yeah, so came, came for, for, for that program, which is a very inter, interdisciplinary program, which is, um, was kind of what I was really looking for, um, coming from more of a fine art background and, um, kind of being a strange early on gr gr growing up in, in Kansas City, Washington, D.C., uh, Minnesota, um, you know, being super interested in fabric and building things, making things with my hands, but kind of estranged from actually kind of more traditional STEM education um, and kind of getting pushed more towards the arts. And then I think finding my way back kind of through this lens of art and technology together at MIT. Um, and then once I, you know, after graduating, I had, I had um, 
rub shoulders with Skylar, had you know some great interaction. He's the PI of Self Assembly Lab, um, and started before I even graduated while I'm working at the lab. You know, found myself next to Skindy um, with Jared and um, the whole team, and started just doing crazy research projects, working with huge companies. So this lab's a little bit different um, from a lot of research labs in that most of the funding comes from corporate collaborations, not so much research. So it's a lot more application kind of um, client driven, which is a very a, kind of a big shift, especially being in a big research institute. Um, and it was early on that we we stumbled on to what is now become RLP, um, rapid liquid printing. And it was a, a prompt, um, especially lo essentially looking at the problems of 3D printing. Um, hey, Jordan, I'm, I'm going to stop you. I, I mean, yeah, you're, go for it. You're, you're expediting way too much information. <laughs> I go, and so you're like, you're just like, I just want to get through this. I'm like, I go, but I really want people to understand your background because it literally is who you are and why you are where you totally. why you yeah. decided to go this path. You're in Kansas. I mean, you you moved around a couple of places. What brought you to Boston? Like, I mean, what was it that you really wanted to find in Boston that you weren't getting in? I mean, there are great schools all over this world. I mean, you're yeah. really both of you very intelligent men. Yeah, there are great schools all over the world. Skinny, you ended up back going back to Haiti. What what kept on bringing you back to Boston? Uh, I guess also, for me it was for me it was the real reason my wife one reason um, but also I realized when I got to Boston that I actually had a lot of friends who were in Philadelphia with me that had moved to Boston as well um, but at the time where things were happening Boston is kind of the place where things happened there was a lot of great schools obviously MIT and technology is big and a kid coming from from Haiti growing up in Haiti you hear about those names, you hear about the Harvards and the MITs and the big names. And, and for me to get this opportunity was kind of like a dream come true of rubbing shoulders and kind of interacting with people I think are changing the world. And for me, it was kind of personal. How can I be a part of that world that can eventually help back home? And that was like very personal to me and why I, I needed to be in that environment. Yeah. Um. I mean, Boston's kind of great. Boston's like this, like kind of small city. It's kind of this chill little city and especially in the shadow of New York. But frankly, this is where everyone comes to get their work done. You know, they don't, you know, bars close at 2 a.m. Everyone's like complaining about it, but it's yeah, because everyone's like going home and they're waking up early and they're, you know, running and they're doing these kind of like, you know, they're just working like crazy. Yep, like the, it's a world of lab rats. So that's kind of exciting. I mean, it's obviously it's tiresome you got to get out you got to get up to Maine you got to chill out but um it's a place people get their work done so that's pretty exciting um I mean for me for, for me coming to Boston was kind of interesting because I really wanted to you know continue to go to grad school to really push myself um and I was just really impressed by at MIT um especially the program I went to it's the the way they measure success was a lot more honest compared to a lot of other schools I applied to other, other schools but um a bunch of others but the thing that really stuck out was, I mean, frankly, I didn't have to take any standardized testing to apply to MIT, which would sound kind of crazy. But what it said is that it really cared about was for your portfolio, the work that you've done, who you've been working with. And I think that if they value that, I value them for valuing that. So that was a huge driver, um, someone that looks at you as a person and not just as a statistic on a, pap on a piece of paper. Um, and I think that turned out, I mean, it's also the kind of place where they drop you there and you have to they don't really tell you what to do. Like they're not holding your hands. They're like, you can do what you want and it's up to you. And a lot of people flounder in that because they're really used to being, you know, being brought through a curriculum. Um, and that isn't really the case. So for me, I mean, yeah, I struggled. It was probably the, my first year was like the hardest year. Um, first time I started actually getting, you know, having to get professional counseling because, you know, it's tough, you know, and you have to, it's a big personal thing and it's not about, and that's, but that's what I came for was to really push myself and you do whatever it is to get through. And I think I'm definitely stronger because of that. Um, and that's the same with, I think that's the next moves in my life have been the same as going somewhere that um, respects your work um, on the grounds of, you know, of they look at your success and not the numbers, you know, not how many publications you've done, but who you've worked with and what successes you've actually had. Um, so now we've, you know, starting a company, it's kind of been the same thing. It's, the success is going to be measured on whether we succeed, whether we get this thing off the ground um, and not whether we, you know, there's no metrics, there's no testing anymore. Right. That's not a thing. Well, well I, I love that you just brought that up because um, MIT is known for the pass fail 
um, but I should say pass fail per se, more so like we announced your grades. I mean, you, you see your grades out on that, in that, at that hallway and everyone can see it as well. Um, and a lot of students, like you just said, aren't used to that. Like I was that straight A student throughout my entire life and all of a sudden there's pass fail. When the pandemic started, a lot of schools went that route. They're like, you know what, I go, we're just gonna go pass fail. How do you, I mean, because you went through that too, what would you say to students that are right now? Because right now there are students that are, um, they've been busting their butt, they've been really engaged, they've been, they have that GPA, and now it's pass fail. They're gonna, they're looking to see what their next step for them, whether yeah. I start my own business, whether I go into the corporate world, and how do I talk to people about how that grade affected, how, that, how my grades were, but at the same time, in the real world, grades don't count, or they don't really matter, per se. So what would you say to someone that's in that situation where they're freaking out, and they're like, I was going to be Val Victorian, I was going to do this, and now all of that is thrown out the window. Yeah, I mean, at least for me, it's like, I think my, my biggest driving factor is like, what am I really interested in? Like, what do I really care about? And I think that, yeah, it's like, you need to like, take an honest look at like, what are the things you actually like to do? Like, what actually gets you excited? And if it's grades, then... I don't know, go into something with numbers where kind of grades are, you get some sort of proxy, like, I don't know whether it's investing or like the stock market. Um, Cause you're, if you, if you need those numbers to validate your own success, then like, you got to find something that does that. If not, like take an honest look, like what really motivates you and really question like what your, why, like why, why do you value certain things? And I think the biggest advice I wish I actually keep telling myself is just, just get excited about stuff. Like, like it's good to be critical, you know, at times about like the state of the world, but probably the best thing for an individual is just get excited, just get like deep dive into something, get in some rabbit hole, you know, just let your mind just open up and be wild and don't look, look at it clamped down. Um, Cause yeah, when something happens and suddenly like your, your value system, if it's grades gets totally upended, like, yeah. and you have nothing to turn to and you don't have any real interest and like, what's the point, you know? God, you said that so well, I like that. That was good, fantastic. Um, you are in Haiti, Benny. You are in Haiti. Um, it is the earthquake. Um, um, as everyone knows, I'm Haitian. Um, yay, Haiti. Um, and it is one of those moments where the economy is already on shaky grounds, and it's now even worse. Again, we're in a pandemic. Everyone is seeing every day, not just in the United States, no longer just in Haiti, all over the world. We are watching the world. Um, they're shaking. People are shaking small businesses, medium-sized businesses, the economy overall, some countries can handle it, some countries cannot. At that time during the earthquake, what was the biggest peril that you witnessed that you were thinking we're either gonna rise above or we're never gonna survive this? Um, and, and how does it relate to what you're seeing right now here? Yeah, I mean, I remember the, it's, it's so vivid still in my mind of, of getting off that plane and driving around. It was heavy rain when I got to Haiti and my parents picked me up and not recognizing the places, like routes that I've taken all my life and not recognizing anything because of the rumbles and, and everything that was broken and the people there. But as you must, you, you know, Jody, like Haitians are so resilient. Um, and even among the rumble, rumbles, it's, you could see the energy and the passion of people just working hard. And, it, and it's one of those moments where you realize we can sit around and cry about it and, and really be depressed. But the energy of saying, we're gonna get over this is so strong in Haiti. And it has been for years. It's, we have that history of constantly fighting the worst and getting over the worst, um, the biggest humps. Um, and community support is so important. People caring for each other and that sense of community in Haiti is, is, is strong and it's what's kept people to, to keep going even at the worst times. And I think that's important for what's happening here around the world. And some of it is, is not new to people in terms of the struggle. Um, and what we're going through is, I think, allow people to, re, to kind of relate to one another and realize we're all in this together. And some, it's weird because it, before that people might have been more isolated and you weren't more um, communicative to others. But now we have access to each other. And when we understand the struggle that people are going through, like schools closing, it's, it's, it's an opportunity to, to kind of show what humanity can do and being humane and being caring can do. And, and I always 
look forward to that, to, to meeting people who care and, and partnering with people who care and, and, and helping them out. So, so that, that's really the biggest thing that I've witnessed and, and I'm witnessing now um, around the world. So now the two of you guys, that, and who's that, gem, who's that common gentleman that you guys both know? Uh, Skylar Tibbetts. Skylar and Jerry. Yeah. Okay, so these guys are just, you know, they're doing their thing. Kansas and Haiti come together. <laughs> you guys sitting next to each other. Yeah. What was that moment where like, I go, hey, you know what? We're sitting next to each other. Let's build something. I mean, how did that even happen where you guys like all the, what you had an aha moment you had was a late night. You were just talking where and how did you guys come together and decide to start this business? Um, I'll start Bjorn. I think, you know, the environment that we were in at MIT, you know, myself, Bjorn, Jared and Skylar, and even the other researchers, you know, we're, we're kind of, the environment that we're in is always bringing in new minds and collaborative. It's, it's in the projects that we get, we always joke about how we never say no when we get a project because we might not know the answer when, when we're asked to do it, but we're gonna figure it out. <laughs> and that's kind of the mentality of the lab and our mentality too, because we love the challenge. Mm -hmm. And when we got posed this challenge of like 3D printing large scale objects or furniture, it got us our brains going and we, you know, as a group started testing things out and then realizing the limitations that existed with 3D printing, you know, 3D printing is so exciting. It's such a great technology, mm -hmm. but we're seeing some of the things that it wasn't good at. And we were like, there must be a better way to go about this. And just, I think just testing things because we always just make things around the lab and that's always a great way to kind of come up with new ideas. Yeah. But, but you, but I'm going to stop you for a second. You guys talked about how, um, there's there are other people there. I mean, there are other people you guys are collaborating. The two of you guys decided to work together. What was it that yeah. drew you guys together? Where all of a sudden we, I mean, again, we have a group. We have a, individuals, and then everyone's thinking somewhat the same. But there's something about the two of you that came together to create RLP. I think there's there's kind of like two there's two projects I think that we're talking about here. There was first the technological you know response to solving some technical problem. You know, and the first pass of, of, of the, the printer was, you know, not very good. You know, it was just, oh, this is interesting. And we kept messing with it. The next project, it got a little better. We figured something else out. And eventually we found that we were sitting on all of this stuff and we're just looking around being like, like, wow, we looked at like our original prototypes and they were kind of, you know, dumpy, interesting things. to like what we did, you know, last week and we're like, wow, this has come a long way. We're really sitting on something. And at that point we had been, we had worked with um, Steelcase, we worked with BMW, um, native shoes you know all these big companies who were then starting to ask us you know okay so we want to use use this process you know in industry part of being at, at MIT is that they're not going to sign a contract which allows us to essentially go commercial um, with them and so now it's actually the problem isn't say a technical problem anymore it's sort of an organizational problem and that's I think really where Skindy and I came together because I have definitely the, more of the technical mind I'm happy to just not answer my emails emails all day and just be in the lab and making stuff. And, you know, Skindy is like really organized. He's, you know, or, you know, managing this team of undergrads, grad students, PhDs, me, you know, <laughs> managing our boss. Um, and so that's where it's like, okay, well, if we come together, can we restructure this in a way and put together an organization which allows us to take the technology farther? Yeah. And I think that's really the, the project that we're now solving and which is, you know, I say forced us, but allowed us or really given us like the kick in the butt um, to go outside and, and do this as a company. So everyone, I mean, like, at this point, everyone has heard about 3D printing. I mean, like everyone, it's so excited about it. Um, and it's so funny to say that within like 10 years of me being in that room where I've, I've witnessed 3D printing hard, back and forth, back and forth, laser, 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 it has evolved in such a great way. When I met you guys, it was like, you described it where like it's flexible. I'm like, okay, well, it's flexible, it's flexible. flexible. Um, I still, in my mind, still thought about hard shell. Mm -hmm. I thought about like when you're watching Grey's Anatomy and they're like recreating bones and they're recreating things. So it's now getting from the mainstream where everyone's starting to get used to and comfortable with 3D printing. It was so amazing when you brought up the flexibility of it, mm -hmm. how that had changed. And so can you talk about what was that moment of seeing the, what 3D printing was, converting it, and like, um, you, and again, you don't, you don't have to go deep into the secret sauce, but more so, what was that moment where you realized it could be flexible, and then what different areas were you using it in, and how were people perceiving this brand new way of seeing 3D printing, 
and also the fun part where I can't wait till people see how it's developed, but how did you guys decide to do it the way it is now? Because everyone knows about the dust, the layer, I mean, the, how dirty, and there's so many different ways of doing it. You came up with a new way of doing it. So can you guys talk about that? I'll start and I'll let you get into the technical stuff, Bjorn. Um, I think it's, again, we're in an environment where we like to think about the future. We always want to be working on what's next, what is no one else doing. And we're well versed in terms of what 3D printing could do at the time. And when we started realizing, oh, we could like make things that are flexible, at least people are thinking about it or no one else is thinking about it, let's go for that. And that became kind of the target. And when we started messing with, like Bjorn was saying, when we started doing things that were like, mm, this is interesting, but not great. And then months later, messing with it some more and realizing, oh, we're getting good at this. Like, this is really good. Like, this is actually amazing. Let's keep going. Um, we realized, all right, this is, to us, this is the future. Let's, let's keep going on it. And, and Bjorn, I'll let you kind of dive into the technical stuff, but that's kind of the moment where we realized this is going to be fun. Um, yeah. And to be honest, even to... To this day, we're still discovering new things about it. <laughs> yeah, definitely. I mean, and that's been, yeah. So to describe the process a little bit more for if anyone doesn't quite quite understand, what we're doing is we're, we're doing um, um, essentially an extrusion-based 3D printing, which is you were saying your little thing going back and forth, which usually it spits out some hot plastic. It's like a hot glue gun on a robot, you know, is kind of how it traditionally works. Um, but what we're doing is we're using, it's a, it's a tank of gel. Um, and what that allows us to do is to extrude liquid-based materials that cure. Um, so it's not like they're hot and then and then they solidify and cool down. It's that there's a chemical reaction which causes the material to go from a liquid to a solid, uh, which is really common for like a lot of rubbers, even a lot of plastics you're used to. That they're they're called thermal set materials. Uh, it's a different class of class of plastic, um, and they're usually much more higher higher quality, um, generally more expensive. Um, in this case, medical grade, you know, um, skin safe, that sort of a thing. Um, but yeah how we got into the flexible thing that was a it was frankly just we were doing like there are some like a lot of flexible materials a lot of 3d printing companies are trying to do flexibles um but they're very poor i said you know they're very very low quality um there's some big problems with porosity um low stretch and we were doing a project that was supposed to be based around essentially inflatables inflatable structures and we were trying to use 3d printers and we had that project on one hand and then we had you know this other project which was trying to do very big fast printing on another and we're like, well, this, and we were using traditional 3D printers and they were horrible. Everything was breaking. We would like inflate these little air pockets and they would break after like four cycles. You know, it was really bad. And it was this moment, I think it was out of, out of one of our lab meetings. We're like, can we just, can we try to do the same? Can we try to maybe take this process? Cause we knew we could do these materials that were much more elastic than what we were getting from a traditional process. And I think the first time we tried it, it was pretty bad, but it, yeah, it was just like that little inkling of like, this is possible. It kind of worked. It's airtight. Um, it was very much application driven. And that's what, yeah, I mean, we have to keep doing is like, just trying, just giving it, getting a prompt and just seeing if we can solve it because that's been the, like the number one driving factor. Um, and also recognizing that, you know, not every success looks like, is like super crazy. It doesn't look amazing, but it's just recognizing value when you see it or recognizing the small glint of like, something that could grow into something else. And I think that's what we've gotten pretty good at. Uh, it's something we can't, that's like our core to like how we've worked as a team coming out of university and um, going into, you know, the private sector. So um, one, I mean, I thought, I think the product is phenomenal. I mean, I mean mm -hmm. I'm one of your biggest fans. I love the product. Um, I cannot wait to touch it. I mean, that's one of the things where we're living in a virtual world and my entire relationship mm -hmm. with you guys have been in, on the computer and I love how it's been versatile where you, I mean, you mentioned it, you've worked with BMW, you've worked with um, Steelcase, which is like a furniture um, mm -hmm. um, based company. Um, the, the, the product can be used in so many different ways. What other areas are you moving to use the 3D printing? Um, I mentioned Grey's, Grey's Anatomy uh, in mm -hmm. regards to hard. Um, what other areas are you, are you thinking about going into? What other areas are you going into? Um, and how are pretty people on the other end perceiving it? So now there are organizations that you that are actually touching it and seeing it and using it. How are they, what's their feedback? Yeah, I mean, it's been great. I think because we're using, uh, you know, products that are used on the market, one of our biggest goal with the company is that as a 3D printer, we don't want to just be printing prototypes. We want to print end products. Um, and the materials that we're using are, are body safe. So we've, we've actually been exposed working with other labs and now companies that are interested in, in 
liners or prosthetics and orthotics that can be printed and custom for people and help people that way. So, you know, you mentioned the Grey's Anatomy and we've had great conversation with different hospitals around Boston, you know, about printing trainers, like parts that they can, surgeons can work on to actually help them get better at performing mm -hmm. on um, doing surgery. So that's exciting for us. And they're excited about the possibilities and we're learning a lot from them too, in terms of what are their needs and how we can solve those. And so it's been a great learning experience. Um, so there's the medical field. Um, there's a lot of work that we're, we've gotten involved in robotics, um, which is also exciting. Um, and like you're saying, the minute people touch it and play with it, it's like, whoa, what? <laughs> so and that always gets us excited that they get to, to see that. So yeah, and I think some of like the most heartening, I think, sort of comments we've gotten from different clients is, you know, even though we feel like it's not complete, you know, the process isn't perfect, we're still working on it every day, is that they're like, yeah, but we can't get this any other way. Yeah. It's that thing of like, even though it's not, you know, we, we think that it's, we're, we're here and we're going to get way up here in terms of, you know, how well it works and the speeds and everything and the materials, there's a lot of room to grow, you know, it's, we want to grow that team and we want to, you know, continue to, you know, push the boundary, but even so, these huge, you know, companies that we're working with were like, well, this is our, you're our only option if we want to do this. If not, it's just a moonshot idea for us that we'll just, you know, get dusty on the shelf. So for them to say that is like, okay, you know, it just makes you feel good, like, about what you put together. Because sometimes you get, you know, especially me, kind of, you know, nasal gazing, gazing, just like, not quite, you know, sure about what you have, like, not really sure how it fits in the context of industry, uh, you know, and, and frankly, because we're doing um, what was more like a platform technology, like the industries it could, it could, you know, that it is helping are pretty broad. It could be medical, robotics, but pretty much anytime you need a flexible part, whether that's gasketing, um, anything that's soft, pretty much, yeah. you know, what we can get into. But that, that means that I'm not going to be an expert on all those things. So to have someone make those kind of comments is pretty motivating. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, well, I have two. I have two questions, but they, they go in different directions, um, and I don't want to forget them. So I'm going to just spit them out. Number one, in regards of um, toxic toxicity mm -hmm. in the plastics, um, that's one of the things where I think that it was one of the first questions I had ever asked you. Where yeah. um, if I'm using this as in um, if it's like a if it's being used as a something on my body, mm -hmm. um, what are what, I mean, what are the concerns? Um, at the end of the day, I mean, most people know you have a, a bottle of water. Um, the water sits in the in the bottle for quite some time. You're not drinking that water anymore. So, can you talk about that? Because I'm sure that as you're elevating the product and it's now being used and consumed by individuals on their body parts, um, what does that look like? Um, and have you thought about that? And have you get, gotten that question? Number one. Number two. You're two young guys. You're two young guys. I go and you guys have baby faces. And so you're walking in and you're working with these companies. What do they think? I mean, I mean, I have a baby face. I'm not even close to the baby face age. I mean, I'm 51 years old and people are like get blown away. And so I, I mean, I, sometimes I throw out, I know I look at Born's face. What? Sometimes I have to throw that out just because people are like looking at me like, oh, who does, like, how does she know this stuff? So I'm looking at you guys and I don't know how old you are, but you you have baby faces, but you're both brilliant. So when you're walking to these companies, um, yeah, you say MIT, they're like, oh, all right, they're smart but they don't think that you have people skills at the same time and you're running a business. So what is that interaction with both the Texas? So two questions, toxicity, and then you're dealing with, you're running a business, you're CEOs of this company and you look like you're 12. I guess I'll do the toxicity. You can cover the baby faces. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, toxicity. I mean, that's, that, that's a big one. And I think that's where we've, I guess I just been, had a really happy accident, but it was, um, so that there's many different plastics on the market um, to get in the technical details a bit. Um, you know, there's different curing agents. There's, when you say you have like a, a plastic water bottle, that's probably like a um, polyethylene, um, um, HDPE, something like that, like a milk jug. And those, yeah, they, they break down in, in UV light. They leach stuff out. Those, they're pretty safe, but you know, like over time it's, it's not good. Um, and what we're, so what we're doing as a process is, and okay, a lot of other 3D printers, they're using strange chemistries. They're using, they're reformulating materials to make them, make them work, to be able to do something that's interesting geometrically, you know, how you're producing a part. And a big part of, of our process is, hold on a sec, we don't want to have to, you know, reinvent materials just so you can make something out of it. We want people to be able to take an industry standard material and being able to produce it in a new form. And so silicone rubbers, it's a, it's especially the kind we're using, it's a platinum cure silicone rubber. Um, they're extremely durable, um, non-toxic, heat resistant materials. It's the kind of same thing they use for, there's a lot of 
say collaps collapsible um, dog dishes or spatulas for the kitchen. You know, you can use them in your cast iron skillet. Super high temperature, it doesn't break down. They don't break down under UV and they don't, they don't leach chemicals. It's, it's derived actually from silica quartz, um, from stone. It's not from a petroleum um, at all. Um, so it doesn't have a lot of these, these adverse issues. The stuff they use inside the body, you know. Um, and so there's, there's a whole, you know, a whole science um, behind that and years and years and years of research. And we want to just tap into that directly and say, yes, all of that research is still applicable. All that science, all that testing, all that rigor is preserved as we put it into our printing process. We don't want to have to go back and be like, well, now it's, now, now it's like reconstruct 50 years of like science research and testing on this material. Let's just tap into that directly. Yeah. Um, and that's been, that's done a lot for us in terms of, you know, being able to have very, very, very high confidence talking about medical products, um, talking about uses on the body. Um, Cause we're not reinventing the wheel. We don't need to. Yeah. And that's what makes it exciting and, and great for us. Um, and I think the baby faces are, to be honest, is our secret weapon. Um, Cause I think people just assume and, and they count us out thinking we don't know much or at least they don't expect us to know as much as we do and and that's a great kind of super weapon to have and and when we have a technology that's kind of spectacular and, and is the future in our opinion of, of what 3d printing and making can do people get even more excited and and when we have to prove that we have the traction and we're talking to these people it, i think people are it, it gives them a good impression of, of who we are and we're hard workers and and we we know that because we we might look young, people don't expect us to succeed and, and it makes us work harder. And, and that's something that I've dealt with all my life. And I'm sure Bjorn is kind of, people assume things by just looking at you. So it, it just make us more prepared, I think. What has the pandemic done for you? I mean, you um, decided to launch this business. Um, you have this amazing technology. And then where, as you're working hard, you're like, you know, getting into accelerators, you're like talking to people, you're like working with different firms. We go into a lockdown, you um, are now dealing with a pandemic. What has that done for you in regards of how are you growing your business? Uh, where do you want to go with it? And has, have people reached out to you thinking, hey, there's a way this technology can help us with what's happening right now in this world? Um. It, weirdly enough, the, the technology has actually, uh, the, the pandemic has made it easier for us to access to people. I think just the fact that everyone's now being online and Zooming someone is so easy and normal that it's easy to say, hey, let's jump on a call and talk. We have something amazing that I think we, we can help you with. Let's have a discussion. And, and I think those processes would have taken longer if we weren't kind of all stuck at home and, and doing that. So I think it's helped our, our business. And at the same time, the, the issues, or at least the, 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 the challenges that the pandemic has, has brought onto us has made us be more creative and versatile in terms of how we address and built this business. You know, mm -hmm. like I have a garage that's now a space that's becoming a shop. It's, it's so cliche, but that's what needed to be done because nothing else is open. So we have to think and figure out what else can we do to make that happen. Bjorn's basement is a shop, you know, in the meantime so there's like we're, we're very versatile and, and flexible and and we make it happen and I think for people to to see that we're able to do these things during a pandemic in a basement and it's like imagine what we can do without the pandemic you know yeah. and, and that's the reality <laughs> I mean we also I think we definitely got I'd say a bit lucky in that the, the timing like um you know we don't have any we have no debt right it's just us mm -hmm. like we've just made this work just us and so there's not somebody getting stressed out for us, breathing down our, our, you know, our necks. Um, and we, we, we see some sort of sibling companies in a similar space, you know, in 3D printing, doing something similar, who are, you know, a year or two further along than us who are really struggling. And, um, you know, they've rented out these massive spaces and big staff and suddenly the contracts are, you know, put on slow down or, you know, soft cancel. Um, so I, yeah, we definitely kind of got, got lucky in terms of that. And for me, it's been almost like, I'm gonna say a monastic experience, but the fact of just being definitely at home and not seeing as many people of like being, your mind is, everything's kind of simplified. You know, it's kind of this routine, uh, which has not been easy, but uh, maybe a good spot to be when you're trying to do something very different and kind of definitely learn about, you know, what it means to, to do this work as a, a company and not just as a, you know, a researcher.
Yeah. So kind of lucky. Um, yeah. And, you know, also very blessed to be in a, have a, have a good home, have a good place to live. Um, not have to go home to my parents. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, um, I love how you said that it, it, you're, you're very, well, we are, I feel that we're all blessed. I tell people that this is such a gift. Um, and if you use it well, I mean, you never want to waste a good crisis. We're in a crisis. And I feel that when people are like, I'm watching Tiger King, I'm depressed, I'm going to sit there and I'm just going to moan and groan. And I'm like, you know, this is an opportunity to do so much. So you guys created your, your shops and your garages. What else did you do during this time? Personally and professionally, what other things did you do during this time that you would have never, ever, ever done? Because you didn't have the time. You were focusing on so many things. People were just pulling you from one direction to another. What things that you brought into your life that you just would have never thought, God, I would have never done this, or I would have done this like uh, maybe five years, 10 years, one year from now. For your company and for your new company, yeah. as well as for yourselves. Yeah. Personally, I've, I've watched too many Sesame Street episodes. That, that's one. Um, but I've, I've had the opportunity to, to, to really enjoy being a family. You know, I have a soon to be two year old, and it's, it's really given me an opportunity to be, to be a dad. And, interacting with my daughter more has taught me a lot about patience and also how to deal with someone who's not listening to you and or ways to interact with someone differently. And, and I think that's helped me prepare myself as a business owner now to kind of go into this knowing there might be many steps. It's not going to be an easy process. It's not an easy road. Um, and, and, having the time to sit down and learn more about how to make things and interacting with Bjorn a lot faster too, in terms of we're not decimates next to each other anymore, but one phone call away, one to zoom all the time. And we're learning about each other this way too. And we're learning the business together and how to talk to clients and customers and, and share ideas. So it's, I think it's been, we've taken advantage of this time to kind of learn more and ed educate ourselves. Yeah. And it definitely has been like a great space for imagination for me. Um, when you're suddenly in a space, which is almost like a holding space. It's like we're in this little, I think people talk about their homes in the pandemic because like, what is it? It's like spaceship you, you know, like your little, your little spot. And it's, you're almost waiting, you're in a holding, you're in orbit and you're waiting to kind of, you know, get beamed back to earth and restart. And it's been actually a really, really good spot to imagine. How do we want, what do we want that to look like? And especially in terms of like, like a new company in terms, you know, in terms of stuff like physical, physical things like a space, like how do we want to have it laid out? Like how do we actually want to structure that? it's been really good kind of knowing that this is temporary at the same time, this is dragging on pretty long. It's a pretty long temporary. Um, so I've started to really have to do some stuff personally to, um, you know, doing actually a lot more like meditation every day, cold showers, stuff to like wake you up, you know? Yeah. It's actually been really, really wonderful. Um, but realizing you kind of have to inject yourself with a bit of, um, I don't know, some like physical trauma, not trauma, but like mild, mild physical traumas to kind of, you know, shock to the system. And you're talking about running every morning and people do that all the time. I'm not, the best runner I have problems with um, um, tendonitis all the time so that keeps me from that but I think cold showers has kind of been helping um, yeah like those small things you have to figure out for yourself um, and then also just letting yourself imagine and like dream um, when you wouldn't really do that when you're kind of running around town all the time dealing with like physical infrastructure you don't have this the space or the mind the mind space to or the longing to like build something yeah yeah I, th I think that you guys uh, hit it on the nail there where um, I'm usually, I mean, I'm 60, 60 to 65% of the time I'm on a plane. I'm um, usually with like, when I'm like working with like teams, I mean, they know I'm on, I mean, I'm on Skype, I'm on Zoom, I'm on anything, but they are, they always ask, what country are you coming in from? I'm like, I go, I know, I never know where I'm going to be. And it's been really nice where I start my day, where I get up in the morning and every, doing something, like I get up at 425, um, 425 to 630, it's a quiet time. It's my reading time. It's I go for my run. It's so quiet, but I like, I enjoy watching the sunrise. I'm very, very lucky to live by the ocean and I it's just being out there watching the sunrise it's I tried meditating I it's just so noisy when I meditate I suck at it I really do but my meditation is I have the camera I have the sun I'm yeah. happy as can be and it's just it's quiet and this is usually myself and this one con this guy named John he's a construction worker and we always meet each other we say good morning and we sit in our corners we watch the sunrise and we're like all right have a great day and we go off it's just those, those yeah. little, little moments that we just take for granted every single day that sounds like meditation. I don't know. <laughs> I don't, well, you know the thing is, like, everyone yeah, there, like, there I, I think I read so much about meditating, and I'm like, well, am I doing it right? Am I doing it wrong? And I'm like, you know what? 
I'm just going to start doing it on my own terms. And as long as I'm happy, I'm smiling. I think I'm good with that. <laughs> All right. So what would you say to someone that is looking to start a company? You guys could have been totally fine what, doing what you did, being underneath someone else's like, you know, umbrella of knowledge. Um, you decide to start your own company. What would you say to someone that is thinking about it? Because right now people are at home. Um, they are getting paid. Um, some people are not getting paid. They've gotten laid off. They've gotten fired. Uh, they have an idea and a concept, um, high level, low level, all different. I mean, 10 years ago, this was where we were. We didn't have Airbnb. We didn't have Lyft. We didn't have Uber. We didn't have uh, Amazon as it is right now. And then it's evolved because of the crisis 10 years ago. Yeah. Someone, everyone, you guys are part of that. Amazing things are going to be coming. I mean, I'm so excited to see what's going to come out of this. What would you say to someone that is like so right there, ready to go and start, but they're kind of hesitant? They're comfortable with that paycheck. They're comfortable with having someone else leading their way. Um, they're watching you guys right now saying, Ooh, if they can do it, I should do it. I could do it. What ifs, could have, should have. What would you say would be the best advice to anyone that's contemplating making that move of starting their own thing? Just start. Um, I think we've, we've, talk, we've, we've talked about this technology. We've had this technology and, and we talked about starting a business. I mean, it's funny because when we actually went, all right, let's do it. Let's do the paperwork. Let's become a business. Part of me was like, oh, I wish we had done this two years ago. Like, I'm about to be a father now. Like, things are going to be different. The reality is, it's, it, I think just like having a kid, people tell you there's never a perfect time for it. Yeah. And you just got to go for it. And if you might succeed or you might fail. Like, every day I'm like, we got to keep going. Let's see what happens here. <laughs> it's yeah. just a bumpy road and, and you just got to start and, and, yeah. and take it a day at a time. And I think there's also trying to figure out what does it mean mean to start. And I think for me, I think the the moment that I felt like we really had started was really when we started to talk to a lot of people. So actually something that really, really kickstarted us was um, early in the year we did the i program, which is through the NSF. And the whole, the whole purpose there is they're assuming, sure, you have a great technology. Let's not talk about that. You just have to talk to a crap ton of people. Um, potential, you know, and you're not selling. You're just trying to figure out what their pains are um, and then learn from them and then start developing hypotheses about, about your, business, your business model. It's yep. for that. But more, more so than that, the biggest part was just to talk to people because um, you can always be inside your brain. It's to externalize it and getting really used to and almost, almost numb to people's responses to that. You know, learning to take it almost externally. And I think the only way we got there of just being able to take someone's opinion, you know, just to listen to them and to not get emotionally, up, you know, tweaked out by it was just doing it a ton, a ton of times. And eventually, and now it's pretty easy. Like we can listen to anybody. We can hear someone just like hate it and be like, you know, the, like the statistics are behind you at this point. It's like one other person's comment isn't gonna make a big deal and it helps you make much better decisions. And so that's where it really started to feel very real because you start to form those opinions in yourself in context of other people. Yeah. Yeah. If you had um, that one goal, I, you know what? I'm not going to ask it that way. Um, I'm going to ask the, the final question because I, I could have gone in different, different ways, but you, you, I think you've hit so many different um, avenues of people understanding what you do, how you do it. And I'm going to actually make sure that the video is attached so that way people can see exactly what it is um, and different levels, which it makes it so much, it, it really does make it so much more fun when I, we get to watch it. Um, and just to see the excitement of where you've come from and where you want to be is amazing. Yeah. Um, I, I love that. So my last question is, if you had a personal and professional ask, you got to answer both of them, a personal and professional ask from anyone that's listening to you right now, what would those asks be? Um, <laughs> this is a tough one. <laughs> it is a tough one. I mean, I think the professional ask is, for me is, come see what we're doing and, and, and we'd love to be partners, come be a partner in, in developing what we believe is the future. Um, a personal ask is be nice. <laughs> be kind. <Bar> so low. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it sounds like it's such a simple thing, but it goes a long way. And it's so personal to me that like, just be open to things and be kind to people and, and kind of give people a chance sometimes. Just give us a minute to, to talk to you and show you what we can do. Um, and that, that would be my ask. It's, it's a tough question, but that's the best thing I could, the best answers I could come up with right now. Yeah, I mean, mine, mine was actually kind of almost very similar. And it's actually, I mean, it's, very, it's been an eye-opener kind of like getting into business and seeing 
gosh, how egos function, I think, in this space, um, for better or for worse. And I think the one thing I think it gets burned out or yeah, boiled off a lot, I think, in, in business is people's, and I think I mentioned this before, is they're just interest in things and they're, yeah, like that childish, I don't know, um, fascination yeah. with things. And um, yeah, like come to us, like let's talk. Like if you're, if you have any, you know, if you're inspired by what we're doing, come talk to us, but also like we want to hear what you're stoked about and we'll get stoked about what you're into as well. And I think that's like, that's the foundation for like a good collaboration is like mutual respect and stoke. <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah, and I think, and frankly, I think it's kind of a personal thing. Like, bring the bring your personal stoke to your business. Yeah. I think, like, bring that same energy because, like, yeah, you can turn off like like your business. Like, you have, like actually, it's funny. It's like my fiance. She's always like, "Oh, you, you use your business voice so much," and it's it's kind of like I'm kind of like, "Oh no, that's but that's my like that's my honest voice." I don't think it as my business voice. It's just my like I really want to communicate this to you because I'm excited about it. Voice. Yeah. Um, it's so funny. I mean, I, it's so funny that you say that because like. Back in the day, you had the phone voice and you had your regular. So the phone, the house phone would ring and then you had to turn on like, hello. Hello. <laughs> Pretty much yeah, totally. Yeah. <laughs> so you have yeah your no, it's fine, it's fine to have voice. that business voice as long as that's your excited voice. But like, yeah, like don't be fake. That, yeah. That, that, yeah. That, that, that's, that's my personal answer. Don't be fake. Like, because yeah. I'm point. not able to do it. So I can't like do it back to you. Like, <laughs> it's an unfair advantage. So. All right. Wait, all right, so I do have a, a very, very last question. So, oh. you're, I know, your name. Very, very, very. Well, let's talk about names for a second here. Warren, when I first met you, I just assumed, I'm like, ooh, Sweden. Where is he from? Where did your name come from? And same things get, like, both of you guys have very unique names. Let's talk about your yeah. names. Because I, I, I'm not leaving without knowing a little bit that's about fair, That's fair. So, I just got, so Bjorn is a, it is Swedish. It's da Swedish, Danish, Norwegian. I think it was a German version as well. But I'm, I'm Danish, Swedish. Mm -hmm. um i i say that my family is thoroughly swedish american mm -hmm. um and and danish actually my my grandfather was 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 born in copenhagen mm -hmm. um and came here as an inf you know as a gosh as a six-year-old um not speaking english mm -hmm. um but yeah we um my mother's a scandinavian baker um but we've been here you know my family's been here for a couple generations um so yeah it's a it's a different thing but um yeah i do get that question a lot um, <laughs> Like, I mean, again, no. the states that you mentioned and then your name, I'm like, mm, I gotta, I need a little bit more info. Yeah, oh. no, I mean, it's not like I usually, I usually don't tell people I'm from Kansas because it's just, it doesn't, it doesn't ring true with my identity, <laughs> but um, I can't, I can't shy away from the fact that, you know, I'm a country boy. <laughs> <laughs> I go, and I go, I'm sorry, I'm Haitian. I've never heard your name before. It's not, you know, last name, okay. First name, where did that, where, what is that? What, oh, come on, give what me is more. That? I'm also trying to figure it out. I'm trying to get it out of my parents and they keep saying they don't remember how, but what I've been able to piece together, at least my theory is, um, it's obviously made up. my dad went to do a name that was very unique. Um, but I've, I've noticed from the, dr the drive from New Jersey, because most of my dad's family is in New Jersey and my mom's in Montreal, but from the drive from New Jersey to Montreal, you always pass Schenectady, New York. So I think my dad took Schenectady and made it Skendy. That's my theory, and, and I believe it's true. And it's funny because my brother's name, I have two younger brothers, one of them's named Jonathan, and the other one is Marshy. So it's like weird, normal, weird again, <laughs> but unique. I love it. And that, that inspired me to make, create a unique name for my daughter as well. So I like it. I, no other I mean, our, I love that. our Google SEO is like on point, <laughs> like hard to avoid us. There's no confusion. Yeah. Well, it's funny because like, cause I have to ask about the names because like people are like, they, people look at me and they're like, it's, my name's Jody Tatiana. And most of, like, especially when I go, like I went to um, University of St. Petersburg and all the Russians are like, you know, your name's Russian. I'm like, yeah, 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 I know. But it's a saint name. So Jody, so when I was born, um, I was like, my mom was eight and a half months pregnant when she came to America. Mm -hmm. And they said in Haiti, I was a boy. So I was going to be Raymond Jr. after my dad. Easy. I came out there like, oh, oh, that's, that's a problem. So at the time, so there's a conflict. At the time in Brooklyn, New York, my dad got off the train to go to the hospital to visit my mom. And there was either a subway queen or a borough queen. And we can't, I can't figure out, I have yet to find this woman. And she was on a billboard and my dad claims that she was so beautiful that I'm going to, I'm going to name my name, my daughter Jody after her. And I'm like, really? After a billboard? Are you joking? And then my, the, the second part of my name is Tatiana where it's a saint name. So all of us are named after saints. And so I'm, it's a, Tatiana is a derivative of, of Tanya. 
But the funny thing is my relatives can't say Jody. They could call me Yodi, they call me Yudi, they call me Judy. No one can say Jody because of our accent. So Tatiana works out. So when I'm with my relatives or when I'm overseas, I'm only Tatiana. When I'm in America, it's Jody. It's so ridiculous. I've yet to search for this woman. I mean, I've, when I tell you I've been to libraries, I've gone everywhere looking for this woman and I don't know where she is, who she looks like, but I'm named after her. So if you guys ever find a Jody, 1969. We'll be looking. Okay, good, very good. <laughs> guys, thank you so very much. I mean, I love working with you guys. I love what you're doing. I love that we had this conversation. Um, you guys are the greatest, I love it. I cannot wait to see what happens next. We're excited. We appreciate all the beauty. This this was awesome. Thank you for this the opportunity. Oh yeah, my gosh! So your energy, seriously. Yeah. Always. I mean, I, I, you know, the energy never goes away. I mean, honestly, never goes away. Like ninety nine point nine percent Tigger, and then that last percent of Tasmanian Devil. Oh, it gets ugly, but you know, <laughs> those are my characters. That's what I am, and I own it in every single way. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Um. And at the end of the year, beginning of next year, I'm going to circle back to everyone that I spoke to and see what happens because we'll know new elections, economy will be changing. I mean, uh, the, the pandemics of the world. I mean, it's going to be a whole new world and we'll see how it looks and we'll, we'll see how it looks like for you guys too, okay? Forward to it. All right, perfect. Thank you so very much, guys. Thanks, Jenny. Thank you. Bye. Bye.